want to thank everybody for being here, especially with weather like this. And I want to thank the family of the Godard Farm of letting us use this pavilion. It's just absolutely beautiful. And I know as the city councilor in the ward, I know that we'll probably be planning to book some functions in here. So I don't want to save my dad. This is all great. This really is. Um, I, I want to something stronger than water. No. <laughs> I want to introduce to my left is our director of the Board of Public Works, Ned Huntley. Good evening, everyone. And also the superintendent of streets, Richard Presoletti. Oh. Thank you. And, oh, hi Doug. Hi there. If you want water, there's some in the cooler. All right. Help yourself. And Councillor Eugene Tacey from Ward 7. Yay! And also Thank Councillor you. at Large, Jesse Adams. Oh. And Peter Kokat could not be here because he's still in Boston, so his aide, Diane Seisnow, is here. I just wanted to let you know our Ward 6 Secretary, Ruth McGrath, is also recording for Adam Cohen, who also um, does the videoing that you'll see on websites, and she's going to video this meeting, and you'll be able to watch it. What, tonight, Ruth? Will you uh, have it on or Yeah, tomorrow? probably as soon as I get home. If you need the address, there's green cards on that little table right there with the website address it'll be up at. Okay. So, anyways, um, I think what I'd like to do is open it up to the public, okay, first. And I'm going to have you just raise your hand, say who you are and your address, and you could go ahead and ask your questions to Ned Huntley. All right, so who wants to go first? Good question for you, Councilor. Yes. Do you want a brief presentation on pavement management in Northampton first? Well, if we you'd like to do that, go ahead. Okay, I think it's more yeah, let him a do presentation that of the state of affairs currently in Northampton overall. Yeah, do that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So what I do is I, I only made a dozen of these hands up. I wasn't sure how many people are showing up tonight. It's really about a three or four minute read to get through this, so if you could read it and pass it on to your neighbor, that would be appreciated also. We've been doing pavement management in the city for since 2009. And we formalized our agreement with a company called VHB. We have a pavement software program to prioritize our paving needs in the city. Um, we started doing that in 2001. And this is a 2012 kind of executive summary of where we are in the city a year ago. We just got the database back, so we haven't been able to update this. These kind of documents are found on our DPW webpage. If you go to northamptonma.gov, go to the DPW page and look at current projects, You'll find a whole section on pavement management. It'll also give the pavement management list for the entire city, the segments of roadways, the type of work that's scheduled to be done, and the dollar value attached to it. So what we've seen since 2001 when asphalt prices were fairly reasonable at $30, $35 a ton, now it's about $75 a ton. We used to be able to do about 10 streets a year back in the early 2000s, and now we're really getting down to one a year. And the problem is, is that our Chapter 90 funds are stagnant, uh, we receive money from the state government, uh, the state, and it's called Chapter 90, and it's dedicated to roadway work, engineering studies related with roadway work, traffic lights, things of that nature. It can also be used for drainage projects. We've seen it go from anywhere from $250,000 a year. The past two years has been about $1.02 million a year. Uh, the issue with this year is that because of the constant fighting between the Democrats and Republicans, they actually released half the funding. So we were scheduled to have a 50% increase this year to, this year to 1.5 million for funding city roadway work and so on, and they only released $759,000. So kind of an example of a broad brushstroke of what it costs to pave a street, we have the current 2013 data for Sylvester Road. They're spoken in two segments. One segment requires what's called a reclaim, which is basically pulverizing the base course and the pavement course and putting down two new layers of asphalt across of it, which is about a, the mile starting at Turkey Hill Road and continue, well, starting at Turkey Hill Road and continuing for about a mile. After that, it's called a mill and overlay, where we actually 
cut down two inches of roadway and put two inches of asphalt on top. To do this road is about $1.2 million. So it far exceeds our yearly budget. Uh, another example is uh, Con Street that was done two years ago. Just to do Con Street was about a $700,000 project. And that roadway is only, I don't know, 2,500, 3,000 feet in length, while Sylvester Road is probably a good a mile and a half or so. But anyways, this report is, is very good because it talks about the pavement condition index, how we rate our roadways in the city. It starts at 100 for a new paved road and drops down to zero when it's basically impassable. And one of the segments I talked about, about reclaiming a section of this particular road, is because it's dropped below a level 60, they call it which means that anything below level 60 to level zero is going to take the same level of effort to bring it back up again. And so what we've been trying to focus on is look at streets that are on the verge of dropping off into that really expensive rehabilitation work and try to do mill and overlays or overlays to keep that up. However, the Chapter 90 funds just aren't sufficient enough to do it. In the second page of this, it talks about our decline of our roadways where 10 years ago, over half of our roads were in excellent condition. And now the majority of them are in very poor condition because of our inability to keep up with it. Other communities have bonded for this work. The city of Northampton has put zero dollars into pavement management since I've been here. It's relied solely on Chapter 90 funds. The third page of this goes into future condition modeling or what we should be spending. And in 2012, the city should be spending about $2 million a year just to keep the status quo where we are. If we want to make substantial improvements, we're looking at putting out $5 million a year for the next 10 years into the roadway, and then probably five dollars or $600,000 a year into maintenance after that. So we really are in poor shape financially with fixing the city roads, so we've resorted to doing maintenance activities like crack sealing, which I call pennies on the dollar of trying to maintain what we have. You've probably been on those roads and see the level black snakes in the road. That's been effective, by That's, the way. It's very effective. It yeah. So we started off with about a $600,000 deficit in that five years ago. We've been putting $100,000 toward that every year. And this year's contract is only $22,000. So it shows that we are finally getting caught up in that maintenance mode. So we're trying to preserve what we have. The other thing that uh, Richie can attest to, and I'm sure he'll speak to it, is from three years ago, we went from a $25,000 a year budget for doing pothole repairs. Now the budget's $100,000 a year. Um, and asphalt three years ago was still the same price. So it's really showing just a really dramatic decline in our roadway health that we have and not sufficient funds to do what we need to do to keep it up. So that's what this three-page mini-report overlines. I'll relinquish it to anyone who wants to start reading it and passing it around if they wish to. And um, I also printed out the partial list here that shows the work based on benefit value. One of the big things the program looks at is benefit value, which is amount of traffic flow also, so that streets like King Street, Con Street, Main Street would have a higher rating because a lot of people use them versus some of the outlying roads where some of the dead end streets or let's say Drury Lane might see 200 cars a day or 100 cars a day. So that benefit value starts up here and drops really low. When you look at the benefit value for crack ceiling, it's magnitudes higher than paving a street because they want you to put those pennies to save those dollars down the road. So the current rating as of 2013 for Sylvester Road out of the mill and overlays for the arterial, what they call the roads here, which is the segment a mile away from Turkey Hill Road out. I hate to say it, but Sylvester Road rates 38 out of 38. It's at the bottom of the level on the benefit value. Not to say we're not going to do anything with Sylvester Road, but this is what the program rates it. When we look at the first mile of roadway from Turkey Hill Road, it rates 33 out of 43 in the streets that need that same type of work. So this is the data. These are the facts. Um, I hate having conversations like this to the, to the public because you're all tax paying. If you all pay taxes, you deserve the right to drive on safe streets and streets without potholes in them. It's a matter, it's a, it's a monetary issue of how we keep up with it. And what I'd like to do is break for a minute and ask Rich to talk about his maintenance activities and pothole activities and skin boxing activities that he does. Yes, we have two people in that that would like to ask you. Go ahead, Mr. Ryan.
For pothole repair? I don't know about the total state budget. The Chapter 90 fund overall this year was proposed to be 300 million. Historically, it's been 200 million. And the governor last year decided, after an outcry from public works across the Commonwealth, that we needed an increase because we can't keep up with it. So he decided to fund it 50% more to 3 million versus 2 million, except now they've only released half the money for this year. So that's historically what has come from the state. And then in the earlier part, I've seen levels as low as $250,000 a year. So Chapter 90 funds have made great strides in the past four or five years of getting us up to the million dollar mark, but it clearly shows that it's millions of dollars short of what we need here. Ned, could I ask you, Danny had emailed me and I forgot to bring his email. And Danny has been unable to access with his wheelchair to go on the road for two years. For two years because of the conditions of it. And is that good? I think it's unacceptable. He cannot leave his home because of the roads. So I mean, what can we do? Remember I called right. you if we could pass. And I actually had email exchanges with Danny a few years ago about that and trying to make it more acceptable so he could get out there on the roadway itself. And we did do some repairs in the area. And this is why I asked Rich to be here because we are trying to do some repairs this summer that are four or five year long old or repairs that can be done. It's called a push box and skim coating, the areas that are really bad. We had success on that on Reservoir Road about five years ago. I don't know if you recall that. We did some skim coating out there. We've done it on Chesterfield Road. And where else have you done of late, Rich? Uh, yeah, Birds Pit Road. Birds Pit Road, by yes. the State Hospital, and down by Redfern? No, by uh, Rural Lane. Rural Lane. Rural Lane. Rural Lane. Yeah, that was a disaster. Yeah. Reservoir Road is in bad shape. Um, we did use the push box on it about five years ago, and I know recently they went through Reservoir Road, Chesterfield Road, and Kennedy Road, I believe, Special Road, and did some pot holding repair again. Yes, sir. So, Granny, 125 Sylvester Road. You mentioned the funding was cut by Democrats and Republicans. I didn't mention who it was, but there's been no resolution about releasing the you funds. You mentioned Democrats and Republicans. Republicans. Yeah, arguing. Arguing about and, it. And uh, how much uh, power do the Republicans have in the state? Not that much. You know, if the Democrats wanted to do it, Republicans couldn't even stop them. But Last year, this an EBT what? card to dead people. Last year, they tried That's to pull the Chapter 90 funds out of the transportation bill and deal with it as a separate item, I'm and it failed to be consensus to pull it out. Zero. So it's been in limbo again. So we do have a half a release this year. I do expect the other half will be released at some point. But when we start planning Chapter 90 projects, we start working in the winter to start planning spring and summer projects. The money is just coming out here, and it's the tail end of the summer. And by the time we go through public procurement in the state, you're talking a minimum of two months between you advertise it, bid it, and, and, and look at and evaluate bids. You're talking a three or four month process before anything even gets put on the ground. So we're already missing the envelope for this year because of the late release of funds. Our big focus this year right now is Kennedy Road. Uh, we have a contract on the street right now for that. And basically we are working with a, uh, it's called a rubberized chip seal. And so there's segments of Kennedy Road that will be milled. Some will be overlaid a little bit. There'll be skim coats. There'll be pothole repair. And then they come through with a rubberized chip seal, which is like, probably you remember the old stone, stone and tar they used to do in the city streets years ago? Mm -hmm. It's like that, but it's a rubberized product using used tires. I've seen a number of the communities locally use it. I talked to Mass Dot about it, and they're using funding it. And it's getting great reviews because once you seal it, the water can't penetrate the pavement. This will be the first time you're using it up here? This will be the first time in Northampton we used it. Um, I live in West Hampton. Uh, they did Southampton Road four years ago. Amazing success, not a single uh, mark in it from water intrusion. So we're trying this. It's cheaper than paving. 
got the life expectancy of probably 60 to 70 percent of it, but the cost is so much cheaper that the benefit outweighs it. So we're trying this in an experiment, and if it works, we've been talking about doing probably Sylvester Road, Chesterfield Road, uh, Reservoir Road, the outlying roads that still have traffic, but they don't have the utilities that we might be opening up the street. And we can seal these streets off for a good period of time without water intrusion. That's one of our goals. Good. Yes, sir. Down right near 401 Sylvester Road, uh, first I want to tell you how much we appreciate your replacing the rotting out culverts down by our, our house. Yes. Everything seems to be working very well. And it's, it's difficult to understand all the financial stuff and all the material kinds of things that you've talked about, but I want to offer a project to you that probably would cost me more than $50. Okay. Down by Zawalik's house, I think it's 545. Is that where it is, Sam? There's a culvert that goes across the street, and there's a cement barrier along the side of the road. There's a drop-off that's about three feet deep. Mm -hmm. There used to be a steel post along with a red reflector on it that warned cars that if you got off the side of the road, you're going to ride your car. Mm -hmm. And there's another spot right over here by the goddess where there's a stream that goes under the road. And if you take a look at that, again, the drop-off right along the side of the road goes down probably five feet. And I know there have been cars that have been in there over the years, mm -hmm. uh, usually in the wintertime when they mm -hmm. slide off. But would it be possible to replace those steel stakes with the reflectors on them to give people some warning that there are two dangerous spots there that they should avoid? I don't see that being a problem. I know the culvert at the other farm, the Wallace Farm, is scheduled to be replaced at some point this year or next year. Um, we have the pipe materials. We already purchased it in advance. We know. That one needs to be done like this one down in the little corner down below where it was done uh, last year. But um, I don't see an issue with putting the stakes in and marking that. Improve the safety of those okay. areas. Other questions before I ask Richie? Yeah, Mr. Okay. Ryan. Yes, sir. Yeah, Will Ryan, 59 Sylvester Road. Um, my concern is a little different. Okay. My, I sort of came to the meeting to talk about safety. Uh, about our safety with the speeding on the road. Mm -hmm. uh, that's more, more, to be honest, more my concern. Now. I'm glad that, to see that, the, that some of the work that's proposing could uh, influence the safety of others. We have a blind driveway uh, you know, on the road, and, and people just really crank up the speed. Um, and so uh, that's, that's more my concern. So I, I, for me, Improving the roadway, to be quite frank, only encourages people to go faster. Uh, and, and, and I'm not so interested in providing a better shortcut for people from coming to wherever else to get to East Hampton. That's not at all my concern. Um, so, and I, and, and I, of course, I want to have people have access to the roads, of course. But I want to know what can be done about the, people, about the horrendous rate of speed that goes on in the roads, on the throughway and the straightaways. The thing I'd like to uh, raise the question of, I've been exploring the fit at the center of this line driveway. You might have known this, we come from Jim Variety. We're the second house on the right, the brown house, and there's a wicked S turn there. And you take your life in your hands getting out of the driveway. It's the driveway of death. Yeah, we, nobody knows it. Yeah. And I have to let my kids get out there, let my wife out of the, uh, to get to work in the morning, I have to rely on neighbors. And when we bought the house, it's our fault for not, you know, we should have looked at it. Well, the realtor is always parked in the street. I noticed that in retrospect. And, and of course, once, I, once the paper's sealed, I realized that what, what happened. Um, we've explored the various options of taking that berm down. And you probably noticed that big berm. And it gets prohibitive. We've talked about yeah, yeah. it. And you have to, it costs a lot of money to take the trees out. Then you have to pay Northampton for having taken the trees out in the first place. Then we have to move the earth. And pretty soon, you're looking at eight, ten thousand dollars or whatever. So the thing I'd like to, that, and also the other thing about the berm taking that down is it helps me. It doesn't really help anybody else, which isn't the community spirit we're all about, I guess, right? That's so not my, true, though. That's, that's a really dangerous place. Is anybody riding their bike? Everything. Yeah. Here's my idea. The rise, too. The line coming from one direction. It's scary, isn't it? We've got it out of it. It's brutal. You don't even need coffee in the morning. You just squirt the ground. <laughs> <laughs> So here's my new idea that would help. We have our neighbor in the Robin Egg Blue House. Uh, Lauren Ace is not here tonight. She has this truck coming from the other way. 
Uh, our neighbor across the road, uh, Skip, was unable to come. He got hit uh, and driven and, and, uh, was coming out of my driveway this winter, and flying it, drove the car 50 yards or whatever it was. It was just brutal. So here's my new idea. We talked, right? We have. What about a speed bump? Mm -hmm. What about if we had a speed bump right, right at the crest of that little blind hill there, which would help everybody in the neighborhood? It would slow people down. People just just, just crank it up for the straightaway. Once they leave our house, we have to delay a little bit. We could even maybe put two or three speed bumps in. Grove Street gets a speed bump. Um, didn't take them long to get one. I don't know who lives there, but they got them pretty quick. Nice new speed bumps. And I know the other place, Most Park got them. What's wrong with a speed bump to just slow down the 18, 19-year-old leaders of tomorrow in their pickup truck as they negotiate the highways of life? Right. So let me try to answer your question about, we have a thing in the city of Northampton that's run through the Transportation and Parking Commission. It's called a Neighborhood Traffic Calming Program, where you as neighbors can gather together and put together an application that goes to the Transportation and Parking Commission that actually makes the transportation, the TPC as I call it, look at this issue. Number one, to see if there is an issue with speeding, classification of vehicles, volume of vehicles, and it's all done by the DPW in-house, the initial review of that. We have a total of 23 applications that we've reviewed in the past four years, maybe four and a half years. Some of them have been funded, some of them have been funded privately, some have been funded by Mass Development, that's where Grove Avenue got their speed bumps from, was the redevelopment of the state hospital grounds. What, what do you mean? The redevelopment of the state hospital grounds? Yeah, how'd they get to... They Grove? paid to rebuild Grove Street, put in granite curving, and put the speed bumps in. Why is that? Because it was part of their development plan. The hospital paid for That's right. Tax money, huh? So your tax, tax money. money. Absolutely right, Bob. Yeah. But that's how that happened. Union Street received speed bumps on their street because it was privately funded by a resident. So what happens is the past four years, through capital improvements, I've requested $100,000 a year to do traffic calming in the city. Not a single year it's been funded. So we have all these traffic calming applications with little to no funding sources. How much does the speed bump cost? To do the do speed bumps on Grove Street? I'm uh, sorry, on Mm. On Union Street was about uh, a donation of five thousand. It was five thousand dollar donation, and it cost us all three of those. That, uh, that included all the materials, signage, signage everything. So three, three speed bumps was five thousand. Two. There was two. two there was so twenty five hundred dollars a speed bump. Roughly, yeah. Yeah, that'd be cheaper than me taking yeah. the trees up. I'll do that. So, so let me explain this. There is an application process. It does get ranked by the TPC. The, the I mean, first is this going to be a boondock? How, how likely? I mean, is this, how, is this a possible? Has it this happens. ever happened? Well, it happens. Look at, how can they say no? Right. Exactly. They're paying for it. So look at um, who's traveled on South Street and seen the new pavement markings yeah. and the alignments and bike yeah. lanes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was paid through a traffic mitigation fund from the state hospital development and a traffic mitigation fund out of the South Street neighborhood. Traffic mitigation funds come from companies that are doing business neighborhood or doing a business expansion and they fund money into the neighborhood to take care of these issues. Ward 3, the Montview, William Street neighborhood, did the same exact thing. They received, I think, about $21,000 in mitigation funds for some business that happened down there years ago. We actually put in four speed bumps with that. We've done some line painting. We actually did a speed study and changed the speed limits from 30 to 25 miles an hour. And that was funded through those mitigation funds yeah, the and the traffic coming. Yeah. Well, changing the speed it won't limit. Matter here. Well, it's so you don't live here. Trust me. I know I don't live here, but it will not. The speed limit won't matter. You have to understand the process of changing a speed limit too. Yeah. It's a speed regulation, and it's governed by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. You have to do an engineering study, which includes doing speed counters, uh, traffic counters. You also have to stand out there and do radar gun for consecutive days. And all this data is collected and given to the Commonwealth. And what they look at is what's called the 85th percentile. They assume that 85% of the drivers are driving safely on the street. So, for example, is we just did this for Bridge Street School, or Bridge Road School. 
where we have a huge neighborhood outcry about the volume of traffic and speeding traffic by JFK. 85th percentile came back at 32. The speed limit's 35. So the data's proved that the traffic's not moving fast. It's the volume issue that they're having. There are 11,000 vehicles a day and kids trying to cross the street. And, and that my problem is Laureus's problem. Our problem is not so much just that the speed does get hot. Really, is really outrageous as people live on the road know on the straightaway. Um, it's not just that. It's that people can't see us coming out of our driveway. So we got to so we got to figure out a way less to get people to comply with. With just that's part of it. Um, um, <laughs> but much more um, so people can have a chance to see us when we have a driver so nobody gets killed. So, and, and so, so, so one of the things that we also do when we review driveway applications, let's say someone wants to build what's a new driveway house. driveway See, you're using the terminology, I don't it's understand. A, to build a driveway, to do a curb cut on any city street, you need an application from the Department of Public Works. A curb cut? What do you mean? A curb cut. You're actually opening up the, the street so you can put a driveway in. It's called a curb I don't want to cut. put in our driveway. I'm just explaining yeah. the process that when we go out and look at a driveway, a new driveway, that's one of the things we look at is, is this on a blind corner? Is this, can this driveway be moved somewhere else, another location, so it's not going to be an issue? Because the only other way to take care of the driveway is to remove the bank that you're having yeah. or realign part of Sylvester Road. Yeah, no offense, I don't care about that. That's not, that's, that's, that's not an issue. Nobody's building a new driveway. I'm just saying if someone did. So well, we're not, I, they're not. Well, I don't I know. How old is your house? They could, you, today you couldn't build your driveway like you could in 1987. Well, let's put it this way. It's not safe. We would make notes on it that it's not safe. Yeah. yeah. And then it's your issue if you move forward with it. I don't know how old your house is. 20 years I know old. I sat in your driveway, yeah. and I wouldn't want to back out of there. In fact, yeah, I'd drive out of there going forward. Yeah, yeah. Try walking across the street from his house to mine. <laughs> so my question is, what do you, I'll, I don't want to take up everybody's time with this one issue. Um, what, uh, I still don't quite understand where to go from here with this. On the, on the speed bump, I think that's a reasonable. On the speed bump, yeah. go to, I can, give me a call, I can direct you to the web page. There's a traffic calming application. You can now. What's the web page? It is go to the city homepage, NorthamptonMA.gov. Yeah. Go to boards and committees. Go to the Transportation and Parking Commission. And you will find a link there to the traffic calming application. Yeah. And that application is, is resident driven. It's not driven from people that live in another part of town and travel through. It's driven by the community that lives right here. And how many people do we need to, to do that? As many as you want. All right. I have one on Loveville Road. You know Christine. Yes. She did hers. She made it out. We went and talked with neighbors because of a problem there. There's no speed limit. So we're going through the same process, Mr. Ryan. Okay, she has submitted it in, and we're waiting to see when something is right. going to be done so, there. So what's happened with that is that the TPC has wait, been waiting for the residents to show up to a meeting so we can talk to them about it. But here's a perfect example where you have speed limits on your road yeah. versus uh, Loudville Road by Drury Lane where Clear Falls is, yeah. has no speed limit. So it's considered to be what they call prima facie in front of the state, okay. which means it's governed by the density of housing over a length of roadway. So as you go through those small corners in Loudville, the speed limit's 40 miles an hour. Personally, I want to go over 30 through those curves, but the police can't stop anyone unless they're doing 40 and they can't use radar there also because, because it's a prima facie street, they have to chase that person and track them for a quarter mile before they can give them a ticket versus if you have a speed limit sign, they can hit them with radar. So, so let's say we, I fill this out yep. and then I have to have people sign to agree with me. Is that the... It's not an agreement, it's an application. Right. But they, they support what I'm they saying? They support what, what the issues of the neighborhood are. Okay, and, and who decides then who decides whether this happens? The Transportation and Parking Commission does. And how many people are on that? Mm. How Eleven? many are Eleven people. And, and I, there's I chaired it. Now I vice now I chair. He's vice chair. Okay. Owen Freeman okay. Daniels Council is chair. Okay. The chief of police sits on it. I sit on it. Um, all right. We have bicycle uh, yeah. sub people. We cover all the... Wayne Feigl from the planning, planning department. Planning and development is on it. Okay. There's active citizens in it. Okay, so then, we'll, then we do that, and then let me just one, one final question. Um, uh, 
let's say that, um, so there's no money, North, North, Northampton's not going to do that for me. Well, let's put it this way, in FY15, when we create our budgets yeah. in January, yeah. I'll put in the same request I do every year for $100,000 towards traffic coming across okay. all the city, and that money would be really geared going into these traffic calming applications okay. that they haven't found funding sources for. Okay. And how many of people have already, have, you, have people agreed need this attention? Um, are, I would say that probably 70% of the applications have had merit to them. I, I believe uh, 13, 13 or 14 traffic calming applications. So there's really, really, really serious merit. Yeah, right. Um, uh, at this, to this level? To this level, absolutely. Okay. Not, out of yeah. 23. Uh, yeah. Out of 20 so that's quite a few people have. And there's, have there's some, there's one street, I can't remember it, was, but basically the data showed that there isn't a problem here. So how do we resolve something if it's not showing that their issue was speeding? Well, do we need more data than you're trying to get on my driveway? Is that data enough? No, that's not data. We look at the roadway data. But we take that in concern that you what, have an issue. What do you mean, the, the number of people? I guess I'm not following your question. No, what do you, roadway data meaning? People, I had to come out of my driveway. Huh? When we collect data, we don't collect who's coming out of the driveway. We collect the type of vehicle that's on the roadway. Is it a car? Is it a bike? Is it a... Is it a Ten wheeler is it a school bus? These counters will pick up that data based on the length of axle between the axles. It's got a little air tube set. Get pushed. But how does that have anything to do with me getting out of the driveway? It doesn't have anything to do with getting out of the driveway. But it tells you whether or not we have a speeding issue on your street, whether or the not dangers of you getting out of the dangers of the roadway mm -hmm. and the amount of traffic on it and the classification. But that seems kind of callous to say if there's not that many cars, it's okay. <laughs> if there's a lot of them. I don't, I, I don't know what happened years ago when your driveway was put in. Yeah. And that if that berm was there or not it when was. your driveway was put in. It was. I don't know what to tell you. I mean, we sat down and talked about this. No, but I, what I'm understanding is, why does the volume of traffic matter? I don't understand it. Like, if, if it's only 20 cars a morning, you can probably make it. But if it's 40, you can't. I mean, it doesn't seem... It doesn't... It'd be like a traffic calming. It doesn't traffic seem to make any sense. It'd be like a tra traffic calming plus on a dead end street with five houses on it. Oh, I see. But this, is, a, but this is the main. Your yeah, neighbors. This is the main. Oh, I know. This is the main thoroughfare from Williamsburg to Southampton. So why do we need data to say that? Because we don't have data to support it. Everything has to be proven. Everything has to be proven. Everything's got to be proven. Everything's got to be proven. Okay, what, what? Yes. A big part of the benefit value that's looked at is the traffic that it receives. That's a big part of the benefit value. That's where you see these ranges from 0.2 up to, or 0.02 for this street up to 1, versus if you're looking at crack zone, it's in the hundreds. Magnitude different because it's little money to put in to save the street from going from deteriorating. So when, when was that calculated? That is based on, I'd have to look at the data, but I don't have it here with me, but at some point we pulled a traffic count from either a study or a mass DOT or a Pioneer Valley Planning Commission counter that was out here, and that's where we get our data that we plug into this database. On some other streets, we make a best guess estimate like Drury Lane, 100 cars a day. Is there 150? Really don't know. It's kind of a mini cut through, but there's no payment left in half the street now. It's just completely falling apart. So I don't see why people would use that as a cup through anymore because they're going to ruin their car. So there may be recent data for our book that we could use. That's right. And so what we do is we had a traffic engineer who left us about two or three months ago. She actually goes and collects data from Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, Mass DOT, and we incorporate that information into our database. All right. That, the, the database that we have gets looked at every year. So what we do is they have this really fancy van that goes around and basically drives around and looks at 25% of the roads every year. So every four years we have a constant updated okay. database of all the streets. Thank you. Um, that data is what's used to put into this program to determine where we need to focus on needs. The assumption is, is that a two or three year period, the street is not going to deteriorate substantially unless it's already below that number 60 mark I talked about earlier where it's going to deteriorate very quickly. Yes, ma'am. So the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission is the one that actually applies the 
data? On some streets. Like that, on our streets? It could be. I'd have to look where the data yeah. source came from. Is that data that they collect, you know, you said it counts, that's the number of vehicles. Do they take into consideration the type of vehicles? Because on this road, there's heavy, heavy stone trucks. And not only is they're all there for the garbage dump for many, many years. That is what they call classification. So do they classify the vehicles? They classify the type of vehicle that's cars. running on the street. And the percentage of the volume, they actually um, I was looking at bridge road data yesterday before the transportation parking commission meeting. And they list the number of cars, the percentage of cars versus uh, straight trucks, long axle straight trucks, which are two or three axle trucks. They look at tractor trailer trucks. And it actually has their actually number of use of road and they use that as a percentage. So how do they collect that they say they watch No, actually there's little tubes that go across the street, there's little tubes of air in them. And anytime the tire goes over it, it makes a little count. And this data is collected. You've probably seen these boxes on the side of the road chain, the telephone poles. That's what they are. They're yeah, data like collectors. We have two in the city that we use for the traffic calming program. We purchased um, three years ago, three and a half years ago. That that's how we're collecting our data because we'd have to pay a consultant to do the same thing. Right. So I can contact the um, Hunter Valley Commission and ask them to collect the data and what the data is. If they have it, it's also quite a bit of it is online. Um, example is we were looking for data on Bridge Road School. We didn't find it. We found out that they're doing regular thumbs from Mass DOT every two years, but they're not posted. So I went to PVPC and they had, I think, a 2006 through 2011 posting of all the streets that they had done by town. You might be able to find it there. If not, I could look in the DHP dat database where our counts came from and the approximate age it was done. They could have been counts from five years ago. They could have been counts from eight years ago. That's what I don't know often. Chris Bob. I'm going to guess that the radar machine that warns you of your speed isn't equipped with a data recorder. I couldn't tell you that. That's not my machine. That's the police department's machine. Okay. I don't know what it collects for data. <laughs> I'm sure it has data collection. How else would they know the volume of traffic that might be speeding and whether or not to actually put a radar program after the fact that it's been there for a week or two. So it must have some form of data collection. I just don't know that. Is that what it's for, or is it just to cost you to just make people slow down when they see it's to make, down? It's to make people aware that this is speed limit of the street. My understanding also that the police usually leave that out for a week to 10 days, and they usually follow up with enforcement. We've given you fair warning. We're going to come out and do radar now, and we're going to give out tickets. That's my understanding how it works. I, I can't speak on behalf of the police department. They're not here tonight. And they're the ones who actually give out tickets for speeding, not me. Let me just explain about the police department. When I had a meeting with Mr. Ryan and his neighbor and another neighbor, there was great concerns about the amount of speeding on Sylvester Road. And apparently... Mr. Wachowski? Yeah. Yes. He was supposed to have been here tonight, so I don't know what's happened yeah. to him. I had suggested about putting the radar speed machine that we had, and in front of the two of us, he had stated where they're useless. They're not. Okay? I, no, I didn't. No, Mr. Wachowski did. And I told him they're very efficient. If anybody on Sylvester Road would like to have it placed on your property, you need to call the police department and they'll go ahead and place it on your front lawn. I'd and rather see a Northampton cruiser we only on my have, with radar. We, it has radar. It, we only have one. It costs $11,000 and something for that machine. And it's traveled all around the city. It goes up to Leeds. It goes everywhere. So take advantage of it because it does. Once they see it, it records what their speed is. I would suggest doing that. Also, the police department, because of me talking with them about the amount of speeding occurring, that they have placed the street on the traffic enforcement request screen that is shown three times a day at shift changes. So each time a shift comes in at the police department, they actually see the calls that are being made, they'll come out. So you're on that screen right now. Mary. And they do this in other streets also. 
Um, now I have to say, Chief Zinkowitz came out here, and I was shocked when I saw this reading. And this was on July 2nd when he came out, because I told him about everybody complaining about how fast cars were going. And he came out like around 3.40 p.m. on July 2nd. He says that as of this date, the static radar enforcement there has resulted in only three cars exceeding the 30 miles per hour limit, one each at 32, 33, and 35 miles per hour. Most were under the limit, and I disagree with that because I've seen them flying through here. Then he said that how he came up here, Chief Sinkowitz personally, went up to view the area on that day. And in traveling the road for its length in both directions, the cars in front of him were driving no more than a cautious 25 miles per hour. My question is, if and was it a police car yeah. which showed the visibility, yeah. it's going to slow you down. Yeah. So that I don't know if that police car was showing visibility. So, but he is saying at the 25 miles an hour as the condition of the road inhibits any safe driving faster than that. So, but please, call the police department, get that speed, the radar speed thing placed on your lawn because we travel it around on Route 66 and up by Lalgo Road, wherever we can get it. Mr. Yeah, Rowley, what time is it, Chief, up here? Yeah, it says that. 3 yeah, 345. You should try 7.30 to 8.30 in the morning. <laughs> that's what, that's what, everybody's going to work and nobody's on the road. That, that's when when people are rushing to work. What they call it, rush hour. <laughs> 3.36 will Mr. Orland be getting an off so my yes. husband takes his life in his hands getting the paper in the morning yes. because he's got a cross. And anyone wants to sit in our driveway, come on out. One minute, David, and someone else in the back had a question first. The other night I was sitting at the picnic table and oh, yeah. since it's been 95 Sluster Road, and since we've been there, we have perfect view of the radar. We watched someone go by there 87. There has been nights we've been sitting there. There has been one red Mustang car that has gone by so fast you can see a blur of red. My mother's been walking our dogs on the side of the street, and because on the opposite side of the street the um, branches are so low, I mean you can't really see her that well if it's night. People have almost hit her. We have three dogs. I know neighbors have dogs, so speed is very very. Low. You might want to videotape. Oh, I, if you want me to, I, I will. Sit at the picnic table and I'll sit there so, and watch it. Yeah. So what are, the, yeah. what are these things we do with the traffic yeah. counts that we do? We share that data with the police department because it does tell how fast cars are going. So recently the bridge road data we just collected last month in June shows us there's a chronic issue between 5.30 to 6.30 or so in the morning. The car is going past the school at 60 miles an hour. So that gets flagged, and they can put a radar device or an officer out there detail to try it down. There's five or six cars, and it's every day. It's five or six cars in that time period. So I assume it's the same person. Mm -hmm. No one's out there. It's chronic. How do you stop it? You give them a hefty ticket. Might slow them down. But that information is coming from these traffic counters. It collects great data, and the data, the data is not emotional. It's factual. And that's where people do get excited that the cars are going too fast, the cars are going too fast, and it, sometimes it can be a perception thing. And one of the streets we looked at for traffic calming, that's exactly what it was. None of the cars were speeding. It was strictly a neighborhood perception that the cars are going too fast. And I don't mean to belittle what you just said, but I have no doubt there's, there's some maniacs out there. You'll see some people slow down, and then there's other people. You'll see it'll be like 33, and you'll see it creep up. Creep up, yep, 45, and then by the time they're gone by. Mm -hmm. Also, if for any reason they are speeding, call dispatch at 587 1100 and ask to have a police officer come out on Sylvester Road. And if Do you, you know can. How many times we've called? We have called very many times. The pull around, we see them, we'll call maybe once a week, or not once a week, but we've called. Later in the week, we'll get someone, we have the pull around right across from our house. Cop will sit there maybe a half hour. They'll disappear. 
they don't catch anyone because they don't sit there at the times that it's needed. When, when you make that call, when you make that call, just tell them that Councillor LaBarge had requested for you to call them and that they need to at least stay in an area to observe it. You need to do that. And I'll check this out tomorrow. Okay, because people need to call. They're there no more than a half hour. Yeah, and depending on their shifts, I mean, if they get an emergency, they're gone. But it's 11.30 in the afternoon and they're sitting there. In the morning. At 11.30 in the morning, you call. You know that there's a cop sitting there because I, I walk the dogs and I, I uh, went in and I got the second dog and I'm like, oh, he's already gone. No, he's just sitting there watching traffic. Even like, the radar got behind us, right. the bushes are right there. So Usually they'll the ask right of, of when the speeding is occurring, and Ned is correct about this, you need to give them times. In the morning, like we have in other areas throughout the ward, people will say, we want somebody out there on site, 7 o'clock, 7.30, just like on Turkey Hill Road. I have uh, Mrs. Malo, who has had and had great concerns, wanted an officer out there at 7 o'clock in the morning. Specify the times that you need to have a cruiser out there. Okay? Because, I mean, if they're speeding, we need to catch them, and they need to be ticketed. And that's another big concern. But I also have some concerns about Mr. Ryan. Well, we've had Tom, time. I, 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 let's let's me, move on. I don't want, the only final thing I would say is I would, I would explore the idea of a stop sign by Jim's. Four way because I think as, as Turkey Hill gets more more people up there, it, it stop sign might be one thing to do to slow the general flow down. But not just for me, but for, for people walking and bikers. It just really is. You can't really walk on the road. Road. I don't know. It's a, is a procedure the same? Yeah. For that? There, there is a procedure. What the city follows the manual on uniform traffic control devices, or it's called the MUTCD. Yeah. When you have regulatory signs like stop signs, or you have traffic lights. There's usually warrants that have to be met. Crash data is looked at. Accident, accident data is a big one. Volume of traffic over a four-hour period. This one really generates traffic lights. And the, sad, the really sad part is traffic lights usually go in after someone has to die, which is really sad. That's what happened on Route 66. See, people don't, people, you all maybe notice that, but people, there's a lot of ambiguity about how to, behave around that four-way stop sign. People don't know whether, some people think they should go through, some people think they should stop. Yeah. Then you start anticipating people are going to stop anyway, and they don't. So I mean, there's a certain, as Turkey Hill gets more popular, that's going to be, that's going to be an, an issue. And it would also just slow the general so, traffic down. So let me, let me explain <coughs> what just recently happened with the Transportation Parking Commission. They have a, a, a ordinance that they can recommend a 120-day trial period and we just done that for Woodlawn, Prospect, and Jackson Street. So in the next month or so, a four-way stop is going to come to the intersection, and it's a trial period for 120 days. The difference between Turkey Hill Road, Ryan Road, I'm not sure if it meets the warrants, but it already meets the warrants for a signalized intersection at Jackson, uh, Woodlawn, and Prospect. The same with State and Finn. It's met the warrants for a traffic light, except to do a traffic light, you're talking a six to eight hundred thousand dollar project. I don't really like this stuff, so. But just so you know, as part of the traffic calming application yeah. and request, we can look at doing a temporary four way stop I'll put it as on part me. of it. Can we do a temporary speed bump? <laughs> no, those are permanent. I can build one right in my garage. No. They're permanent. Um, uh, it also would help the, it would help the business at Jim's, the new owner of Jim's Bride. Yeah. So if you'd like to, I, I'd be more than happy to spend some time with you about the traffic calming application. In the office, yeah, have any questions yeah. about it? Let me look at it. I'll okay. Get back to yes. Said it was a scenic route. Yeah. I've never heard that before, yeah. and there should be some designation 
in the database of roadways about that, and I can go look for that, but I've never heard that this road was designated as scenic byway. <laughs> Usually with a senior byway, there might be other funding sources to do something with or other restricted work that can be done. I don't know of any scenic byways or highways that we have in Northampton. I understand this happened a number of years ago. And I think Steve yeah, knows exactly when it did happen. And I'm not sure what it means, but I understand that it does have some no berms? Well, there are some restrictions also. <laughs> <with> <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we, we still have a county highway system here in Northampton. Even though the Hampshire Council of Governments aren't very active in it, it used to be the county commissioners, which no longer exist. But when we come onto the county roads, we still have to seek their permission to do work and upgrades to it, even though we consider it to be a local roadway. Well, look into the scenic designation that you talked about and see what that means. And mm -hmm. the only place I've seen that outlined is when we're doing a transportation improvement project, which is called a TIP. And that's the stuff that goes in for state funding, like um, the bridges are state funded. Major intersection works like the Roundabout Wood Park was state funded. That's when they start looking at designations of scenic roadways and how that plays in. That's the only place I've seen it. In 13 years I've been with the city. Yes, sir. I'm Larry, not five minutes to this row. Uh, what I've heard so far to sort of summarize is we're way down on, on the list uh, based on, on the studies. You've patched uh, what you can do on Sylvester Road, and uh, we have to improvise and, and, and adjust. So what, what can be done now about the about the road? Are, are, are you done? Uh, no, we're not. This year? Okay. And this, like is what's, what's this is why I wanted Rich Parsley come to speak there. He's our highway superintendent and he is really the one who maintains the city streets. So turn it over to you, Rich. No, I don't do it. Well, Rich. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't do it single handedly. I have a I have a very very good crew. Um, I just want to give you a brief overview. I'm more of the nuts and bolts person. I'm the operations person. Um, and I have a crew uh, the streets division crew consists of basically nine people. Uh, which basically takes care of 165 paved miles of roadway and I think about 7 to 10 miles of gravel or 15 miles of gravel, gravel roadways throughout the city. So not nine people. That includes traffic, uh, traffic uh, lights, all the street signs, stop signs, all the line painting, all the patching of potholes. Um, it also includes all the city tree work. So nine people accomplished that in a year's time. The streets division budget is roughly about a million dollars, which is mainly made up of all general fund money, which is all money that comes from your property taxes. So your property taxes are really at work here, even though you may seem at times frustrated that they're not. However, due to a lot of budget cuts for many years, our personal services has really been flat. So our ability to increase uh, our workload and give you better services has been very difficult. And I apologize for that, but it's kind of out of our control. So we have we have improvised uh, about, uh, I think it was five or six years ago, before I was the highway superintendent, the former superintendent, Ed Button, uh, came up with an idea that he saw in another community where they have this unit um, that fits on the front of a bucket loader that is basically a square box um, with what, missing one end in the front, where basically it has skids on it, and you actually take... Uh, several tons of asphalt, dump the asphalt in the box, and it's pushed by a bucket loader. And what it does basically, it gives you a skim coat of blacktop, roughly about an inch to an inch and a half. And we've uh, used it, as Ned said, on uh, Chesterfield Road, uh, Reservoir Road, we experimented with it. I think the town of Williamsburg has had one. West Hampton. West has. Hampton has one. And they've uh, actually, Williamsburg actually has a paver. So they have a paving operation. They have a lot less uh, miles of roadway than we do. So. Last year we did parts of what we did parts of Loudville Road, Burks Pit Road, um, and one other I can't. Burks Pit, Loudville. Loudville, we, we did another section. I can't remember where. We did we did these areas based upon the amount of calls that we received for potholes, because what's happening now is that we are basically going to these locations and consistently just patching them over and over and over in 
and as you see on parts of Sylvester Road, that's exactly what we've been doing. So we're patching on top of patch on top of patch. So the original roadway is, doesn't even exist anymore. So every time it rains hard, like it did in the last month, all these potholes just all of a sudden miraculously reappear after people drive over them. Whether they're going fast or slow, it doesn't matter. Plus, there's a lot of heavy truck traffic on the street. So since January 1st of this year, we have actually pushed out 320 tons of blacktop by hand. That's throughout the whole city. Um, Sylvester Road has received 24 tons of that itself. So we've been on Sylvester Road and we patched it, I think, twice completely. And then we patched it once in the spring and then we just got done patching again after it uh, ended up getting um, uh, you know, the heavy rain we had. So the, uh, the average, the amount of tonnage that we put out by hand, so these are, now this is four people. Foreman and three crew members put out 2,000 tons a year by hand. So they pick it up on a truck, they put it in a wheelbarrow, they dump it, they rake it, they shovel it. 2,000 tons, a lot of material, if you put it in that kind of perspective. Costs roughly about $144,000 to patch the city roads. And every year, it increasingly gets more because we are not able to pave our roads properly like we're supposed to. So now we just go around and patch it. Of the $100,000 that Ned mentioned that we receive every year, um, from your, the uh, general fund, part of uh, the streets division budget, 20,000 of that comes from the water enterprise and the other 20,000 comes from the sewer enterprise. And the reason that money comes in there and funds that is because we also are responsible for going behind the water and sewer divisions and repairing all the cuts they make in all the roadways. So not only do we patch the potholes, we also patch all their cuts as well. So the, the the, thing, the best thing that we can do for Sylvester Road, and I have a list of roads that we're going to try to do this year, um, parts of Sylvester Road are going to get this box paving done on them this year. It's probably going to be towards the end of August at the rate we're going because we're pretty far behind because of the rain. We're still having pothole reports. Um, this year alone, since we've instituted a new C-Click fix um, software uh, database, I don't know if anyone has used that here. You've used it? Yeah. I don't know. I've I don't, used I don't. it a couple of times. So C-Click Fix is a program now that's been launched that the city is in a pilot program for, I think, three, three years? Yes. The, uh, the software is a, is, can be used on a smartphone. Anybody has a smartphone you can actually just go on there, download it, just search in your apps, C-Click Fix. Basically what it does is it allows you to report a pothole. You just go in there, you look for your community, and ask your community in Northampton, and it just asks you a bunch of questions, you know, where's the pothole located? what's the address, uh, what's your email address, so on and so forth. And what happens is those pothole repair requests come directly to me via email. And then what I do is I print them out, issue them to the employees uh, who work on that four-man crew, and they go and address these potholes. So since January 1st, we've had 333 requests for potholes. Can't tell you how many we had before. We had an older system, an access system that doesn't really work very well. Basically, you'd have to call the office and create a work order, but now you can actually go online yourself. So if you're driving by at a slower rate of speed, which I hope all of you are on Sylvester Road, that um, you can actually stop and look and, and check a pothole out and actually email it to me via C-Click Fix. It's very easy to use. You can do it via computer, but you can also, if you don't have a smartphone, you can either do it by computer or you can actually call our main office and the staff will do it for you. For you. Just ask me a series of questions. It's very it's a, it's a really interesting, it's a, a very good program, um, and it really quantifies, in a sense, how many potholes we really have in Northampton. You know, Sylvester Road is in bad shape, but there's other streets that haven't been paved since 1978. Hinkley Street's one of them. There's several of them in the 70s, and the streets are basically falling apart. And those are totally different because there are a lot of utilities on those streets. There are new utilities other than culverts here. So this year, I hope to come out in, in August and do some box paving and seal up some of these areas that are really <coughs> rough and bad, you know, uh, on the by Danny's house? I mean, he, he lives right down the street here, yeah. Yeah. past yeah. the farm. Yeah, that section around the curve where that ledge comes out, there's a huge water problem. There's no drainage on this street except sheet flow. And so what's happened now is over the years is that all the sand build up from uh, using uh, road sand and just general build up in the road actually sinking. It's raised the edges of the road up. So now the sheet flow doesn't work anymore. So instead of the, when the water runs off, it just runs off to the side of the road, it now puddles in the road. And now that we've had, uh, the road is so old and we have actually, you can actually look at it, it has kind of ribs in it where the tires run consistently. 
the water just can't get over that edge. So box paving is a way to alleviate some of these issues. It alleviates two things. It alleviates the trouble of the roadway falling apart, holds it together for five years, but it alleviate, alleviates us coming out here and patching it consistently. So we're going to try to do some uh, locations out here, um, hopefully. But I have other streets to do as well. We have Pomeroy Terrace is a small section. Audubon Road, which I'm sure most of you have traveled, going up the hill. The hill is terrible. Coles Meadow Road, there's some sections, and there's a place on Bridgeport Road we didn't finish. So <coughs> we have a pretty tall order, and I'm hoping to be able to fill it all. Um, Richard, I have a question about Mr. Ryan's property. Because I've Mr. been on Ryan's site. Is, yes. You want to buy it? No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I tried coming out of his driveway, same as Ned, and it's not good. Where there's trees that are tagged now with the orange tape on it, which are city trees, correct? The road, every road is lined differently. From the center of the road, it could be different in every road, correct? My question is, the embankment of where those trees are, here's the edge of the road, okay? And then we have that nasty, nasty site problem. And then you have city trees. How come the city can't come in with some type of equipment and knock down some of that sand of where that problem is? If it's city property, I don't get this. If there was a sidewalk there, they'd make them shovel it. I, I think, to be honest with you, I'm not going to tell There's you not the a story. Sidewalk. So I said if there was, he'd have to shovel it. The, the, right. the, real, the real issue is, is manpower. Yeah, and, and I know the rule. I, the reason is, it's, I, if you're interested, there's a shade tree committee uh, in the Northampton government. So any time that you, that you take down a tree on city property, years ago the city was concerned that too many trees are going to, leaving yeah. the city. What you that's have to good. do... I have to pay for the tree that's on city property to be taken down. And then I have to pay Northampton for having taken away shade, which is the same amount. Through taking away tree by, by buying another tree to replace the trees I took down. Well, right? It is, but let me explain it. We have what are called public shade trees in Northampton. Actually, they're shade trees across the Commonwealth. Richie knows it all. He's part of the Tree Warden Association. But Basically, any streets that are in the road layout, not just on city property, but in a street layout, are considered public shade trees. To take down a healthy public shade tree, you have to go through a hearing process. So there's money attached to a newspaper ad, there's a hearing at the street, and then who removes the tree? And the Tree Committee of Northampton, which was formed about seven years ago, eight yeah. years ago, something like that, they have a I should say written policy, but an informal policy that they want an inch per inch replacement. So if you take down an eight inch caliper tree, diamond tree, they want four two inch trees planted in place somewhere else within the city. So all of a sudden, besides taking down the public shade tree, and all of a sudden paying hundreds and hundreds of dollars for more trees to be planted, all of a sudden this project gets quite expensive. The road layout by your property doesn't go that far back and the issue of the bank continues on to his property. So the city, once the public shade tree process is taken care of, if we took that bank out in front of those shade trees, the road goes up, it would kill the shade trees. It would take out the root structures it need, and it would kill the shade trees. So we left it as that, go through the public process on this, and then we can work out, we'll take out the stuff that's in the public way that we own, and then he could continue to take out stuff on the private way, or the private property that he has, which is, Part of the problem also. But I still have to pay for the tree. You're not taking it out. I, I'm paying for it. I didn't talk to the tree committee about that, but I believe you had conversations with yeah, you know, no, I, I have to pay for the. The city's not paying for anything. I'm right. not paying for it. Let me be clear about that. Yeah, yeah. It's not, like the, it's not like the city's doing me. I'm getting a free one. So, yeah, I, we, we should move on. I, I don't want to. There's other people other issues. Yes. Yeah. Um, 
continue to restrict commercial traffic off the road? Is that? On this road that has more road. than four tires. I got that. Right there. Right? How is the How is the toll? Yeah, the toll. Oh, the toll. Oh, the toll. Oh, the toll. <laughs> There is a process that you can petition the state to restrict truck traffic on a road. There is a process to do it. I know we looked at that for Clement Street because of the bridge mm -hmm. and the chronic problems with trucks crossing the bridge. However, it has to be a certain percentage of trucks use the roadway. I think it's more than 8% of the total volume traffic has to be truck traffic. And even if you had the restriction approved by the state, certain vehicles could still use it on a regular basis, such as UPS for deliveries, a moving truck coming in to move your belongings out of the house and move them somewhere else. But what it does is restricts the constant truck flow that uses it as a cut through. But that's another process that takes time to do and without the information of the street classification, the types of vehicles that are used in this road, I don't know what that percentage is. Oh, the Jeep guys? Yeah. The old uh, overhead cable line. Which Conservation Commission is aware of that. I've had talks with Wayne Fighting about that. The issue we have with the pole up there is usually a trash dump off point for us that we have to go collect on a fairly regular basis that people drop off furniture, stuff like that. But there. not these guys. Well, no, I don't believe it's these guys. guys. Yeah. They just appear in the middle of that. Like these a, guys, they yeah. leave a piece of paper when they leave, because they know. They know if they start leaving stuff there, they're not going to be allowed to go up. They have a clean up day. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, we, we, and they do a good job. We find TV sets on the side of the reservoir oh, road oh, on a regular yeah. basis. Oh, that's and, yeah. Yeah. And I don't no. get the fact that someone, yeah. it's only 5 or $10 to get rid of it. On a Saturday, we'll take care of it. Yeah. In the winter, when the spring comes, you see the layers of snow right. melting and the layers of trash. So, which is there something you also want to finish up with? Uh, I think so. Anyway, I have questions. She does in the back. Yes. What is the excise tax you pay for cars? Like that is because property tax is what builds roads. What's the excise tax you pay? That would be a question to the assessor, I believe. I don't have that answer. I mean, for you. the excise tax, I always had excise tax because you paid it on your vehicle, was what was used to. For the roadways. I've yeah, never seen that time. money come back into my budget, but since it goes into the general fund, I'm sure some portion of it comes back to the DPW, so but it's not the fund like that. Yeah. 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 So, so we should be able to find out then how much money we pay in excise tax and how much money we spend on roads. We know how much we spend on roads. I don't so, know what you pay on its excise yeah. tax. Is that a million dollars in the city budget? Is it? I, I really don't know. So it just goes to the general fund and just. <coughs> I believe it does. I could be wrong. Um, it could be funds that that comes in to get dedicated to the Department of Public Works for street maintenance, but it never shows up that way to us. It shows up as a general fund appropriation. You were next. The weight limits are usually restricted on streets based on bridges or culvert systems that can support them. So usually that's what really guides the weight restrictions on a street. So currently Sylvester Road, I'm trying to think of any, there are no bridges. There's a couple of culverts, but they don't have restrictions on them. There's one bridge. There's a bridge. Mm -hmm. A little bridge. There's a little bridge right at her. Right at the gym. So, so the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, anything that has a span greater than 20 feet is considered a bridge. So this culvert is probably, I don't know, five, six square foot culvert. It's not considered to be a bridge. No, but she at the has end a of bridge. my driveway, there is a bridge. There is a bridge. 336. 336. There's a bridge. There's rails. Yeah. My mailbox. Are you saying that's a culvert? But it's it's not. It doesn't have any weight restriction signs on it. No, no, no. 
So what's happening is because of the width of it, the state doesn't come out and rate it and inspect it. All the other bridges in the city that are greater than 20 feet in width, every two years the state comes out and inspects, unless it's a bridge yeah, that's... two cars across it at yeah. the same time. No. It's, not about, it's about classification of bridges and what the state looks at. If the state's not classifying with a weight restriction, we don't have them internal to the city. So if we don't measure it, it's wider than 20 feet, we can get a weight restriction on it? We can ask the state to start inspecting it as a bridge, and then they would put a restriction on it. So we have a party on my bridge. So here's, a, here's an example. We, uh, we just got a study back from or an inspection of the Thumb Street Bridge, and again, it's deteriorating once again. Um, at some point, the state said, we'll probably do reclassification, but it takes us about a year to do the classification. So here we are, we'll rate it at, I don't know, 17 tons out there, and in a year it's going to be rated 14 tons, or they're going to keep it at 16? I don't know, but right now the current posting stands. So I don't know offhand, we can take a look at it, whether or not it qualifies as a bridge that the state is going to But that might allow us, if something like that could be done, that might allow the, the oh, wait, 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 it could have a restriction for loaded vehicles, but it might be okay for unloaded vehicles. In other words, a gravel truck. Yeah. When it's empty, probably could pass on it, but if it's full, right. it might not be able to do that. Trucks that used to go to the dump flew over that oh, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And there are certain names I could name, too. <laughs> certain, um, mm -hmm. uh -huh. certain restaurant companies. So... I hope this has been helpful for you. Um, I'll be more than happy to continue discussion, and, and Richie's going to be doing some work here this summer with the crew. Hopefully that takes some of the, the pain off, but as far as coming out and reconstructing Sylvester Road, it's not going to happen with the funding source that I have available to me. The city really needs to look at bonding like Amherst did. Amherst floated the general fund bond for $4.5 million a year and a half ago to start their infrastructure repairs of their streets. So the citizens of Amherst said, we want a road repair, we're willing to do an override to do it. Here's that down payment to get started. That hasn't happened in Northampton. Uh, I just want to say something about that. Amherst is run by city people, yeah. not Cal by town meeting. Right. So they know exactly where their money goes. We don't like the excise tax. We have no idea where that money goes. But they have a whole different government structure. Mm -hmm. So it's probably a little, I mean, it's very difficult to get maybe tax damage because of that structure. But they're willing, I think, to do things like that because of that structure. Which example is this? So just here we don't, you know, we float a bond, yes, I guess it's dedicated money. But, you know, there's like questions like the excise tax. Mm -hmm. Can answer that? Who knows where that goes? You know, we all think we're paying money to get the roads fixed, but where is that money going? Mm -hmm. We don't know. So, I would ask your city councilor, and they probably could find out for you. We have two on the street. Yes, sir. Uh, what's likely to happen uh, to Sylvester Road over the next 18 months? Probably the work that Richie just discussed about, and then probably next spring we'll be back out here doing new potholes that have found, been found, mm -hmm. and at some point we'll probably do some more push box paving mm -hmm. until we're able to secure enough money. We have a, like I said in the very beginning, in 2009 we had a $24 million backlog. That backlog means if I was to spend that money today, it would bring all the streets up to 100%, which is unpractical to do. Now the, now the value is $39 million. So basically in a four-year period, we've almost doubled the cost of the infrastructure, and the price of asphalt hasn't changed in the past four years. It's because our roads are just deteriorating so quickly, we can't keep up with it unless there's an infusion of money to come in. Yes? $1.2 million is our estimate. It's about $1.1 million in just doing the work, but by the time you have procurement behind it, police details, and so on, I just threw an extra 10% on just to be safe. And I don't know what the price of asphalt might be next year, with the price of oil, it's all dependent on it. It fluctuates up and down. That's my estimate, even though 
The two highland ones from the program show it to be 1.1 million. We always try to put a 10% contingency just to be safe. Yes, sir. Um, two, two questions. Uh, just out of curiosity, given the fact that the country is certainly one of the wealthiest in the world and this area is not exactly impoverished, why is it that we don't aren't able to pave the roads and staff police and, and create good schools and stuff? In what is it you don't have enough money? I mean, explain I can't explain that. I mean it seems a conundrum to me. I've been to other countries with a much lower standard of living and they don't have this problem. And anyway, I guess you can't answer. One other th I don't have that answer for you. Okay, I don't think you did. One other thing, um, down uh, toward uh, two of three Sylvester Road in that area is a big field across uh, that's now part of the conservation yes. land that's being uh, farmed. And we're a little concerned about the fact that the farmer there is spraying Roundup. There are a number of children that live on, on the street. And I just wondered about the fact that, given Roundup's questionable track record, why the city would allow someone who's using city land to use agrochemicals. That'd be a question for the Conservation Commission to answer. And, yeah. We don't, we don't maintain their property. Terrible. We don't maintain their property, yeah. but yeah. obviously they have, I assume, for some form of lease or lease agreement with this mm -hmm. farmer. We're actually going through the process right now on our flood control, how to use herbicides in the lock channels outside the river to keep tree and weed growth down. And we're going through the Conservation Commission now and trying to permit that. So there's a process that we have to go through also to use herbicides in the city. I don't know about the farmer, his conservation land, his agreements with the Conservation Commission or the Office of Planning and Development, not with us. Well, I'm glad you know that It's part of the flood control structure that we're required to maintain by the Army Corps of Engineers. And this is one of the things that they push for. And this is one of the reasons that we're looking at this potential stormwater utility, what have been flood control utility, is that the Army Corps has directed that we have to do a number of repairs on our, on our stormwater facility that the city accepted in 1940 from the federal government. But the assumption is they would build it and we would own and maintain it forever. So this is one of the things we're going through is how do we get the Mill River Diversion Channel back into the shape that it should be to pass a 500-year flood? Because it's been neglected for years. Also, in your question about the conservation land and the work being done on it, if you would call Sarah LaValle, she's the Department Head of Conservation. She's excellent to talk with, and she really moves on any concerns of anything being done on conservation land. Her number is... Yeah, I know Sarah. You know, Carolyn, yeah. I, I would give her a call. Okay. If not, if you can't get her, then talk with Carolyn Mish. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you. Yes. I, I have one more question. So, about the, this, the basically our Indy 500 road in front of us. Uh, you, so, if a car... Because some cop sitting out here at 3 o'clock in the afternoon is not getting much. I walk my dog so in the morning and it's like, you know, my child owns that kid. Um, so, who do we call? Like, if a cop, if like, so who do we call about? What's speeding or anything yeah. like that? Dispatch. 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 Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. Just tell them that there was a meeting and that you do know that it was announced at the meeting that the police department. All right, has all three shifts on the call, you're on site, okay, and you would like to have the presence of a police cruiser out here. Okay. And have them stay, if they can, for a while. Yeah. Just so you know, and if you want that radar yeah. screen up, just tell them that you also, your house number, and you'd like it placed. Okay. Just so you know, the 587 number, the same number that gets called for 911 calls, those take part of you over the 1100 calls. It's basically their business line that they answer calls on, just so you're aware of that. All right, great, thank you. Um, question that just occurred to me. Um, there are um, cameras that have motion and take a picture, like, you know, um, 
supply system to see who's walking around the trails and ATVs and so on. But they have to be doing a reasonable speed to be able to catch the, you have to be a certain distance oh, away to make them take the picture. Yeah. And if they're going by at 30, 40 miles an hour, well, they're probably gone by the time the thing shutter speed hits. Okay. But it's something if someone is a local deer hunter and wants to try it, be my guest. Okay. You might collect That's some good data and you might see some deer at night. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm going to leave this to Marianne and Jean, or either or, to close. But I want to thank you for all of your presence here tonight. And if you have any call, questions, please call me, 587-1570. Um, we'll be more than happy to talk to you. Thank you. Thank You're you. welcome. Thank you. Before they go, thank you, um, thank I want to thank you for coming here. And also, the, <coughs> their funding formula in Boston really stinks for us. And we know that. Um, one of the biggest bones of contention for me is the formula, and I've been lobbying uh, Peter Colcutt and Senator Rosenberg and Jim McGovern, our new congressman who has an office on Pleasant Street, to work together and try and change that formula. If you remember three years ago, there was a big headline that said $155 million in new Chapter 90 funds to be distributed throughout the state. I think it amounted to $20,000 for Northampton. <laughs> so, this, so when the hoopla was the huge headline, and I remember we got less than what it cost us for the increase in the price of diesel fuel for that year. It was less money than that. And the biggest driver for us losing out on the formula is the MTA. Their debt service costs them twice what it cost them for their, pers their entire personal services, just their debt service. So we pay for the subway. We as much money as we can send to Boston, and we ask them, will you send us back some more money? And they say the formula does not allow for it. So anyway, so call your representatives and your senators and say, look at, change the formula. The formula was actually set back in 1993. And we're stuck there in time since 1993. So it's important. Call your representatives and your senators and just tell them that we need more. Uh, we do. These guys are overworked and really understaffed, uh, and there's no money. There's no money for blacktop. There really is. I'm on the finance committee. Uh, Marianne Labarge on the finance committee. Jesse knows. We talk about this all the time. There is. There's no fun. It's all about money, and um, I think they do a great job with very, very little money. I mean, little money. If you think of a million dollars to do all of the city streets in a year to maintain them, it's really not much money. It's nine guys. Um, so. Anyway, I just want to thank them for their service, too. Jesse, would you like to say anything? Well, uh, well thank you for having me. Um, with respect to what Mr. Ryan said, I, I do think that all the members should, fill out, should, should go ahead with this process and the system in it. Um, and I would just like to remind you that that particular project that um, I, I was, I was, I've been on that, that committee previously, and I was the vice chair at one point. For that type of project, um, if there is funding, we'll go a long way. So if they do determine that there is a, a uh, that, that you would benefit from traffic calming measures, um, emphasize that you may have a funding source because that could get you up the queue very quickly. Um, if you've got great, it was if I was the funding source. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you, if you could come up with funds, I mean, if, you, if you could manage to raise them. Uh, right. Just to go another route to start. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, and I, yeah, I want to say one thing. I mean, I don't want this to be about my our little problem where we live. I mean, that's really great. I appreciate everybody's support on that. Really do. I know everybody travels the road. And nobody wants to hit anybody coming out of anybody's driveway. I appreciate that. A lot of the frustration, just to sit, respond to what you said earlier, is not about the construction because we understand that takes money to build roads. A lot of the frustration, if you heard what folks are saying, that's about safety. And not just in my driveway, but walking your dogs about 
uh, what's going on in the field, crossing the street. Safety is really, and, what our, and our frustration is much more that we don't see what it costs money. We just see what it, it's, sort of, it's about common sense, and it feels like any time you try to do something about it, there's always five reasons why you can't do something about it that seem unrelated to, to expenditures and seem much more about all the things you've got to fill out or all the things you've got to go through or all the things you've got to do. And that's the frustration. We understand that nine people work, and I'm sure they work their asses off in this heat. We understand that. I understand that totally. They work like dogs. I'm sure they do. We understand totally how hardworking you are. Our, the frustration, at least from my end, what I hear is much more about how to make this a safe community to live in and, and on the road. That's really what the issue is, really. Not, not paving a pothole. Mm -hmm. If I could add one thing. So, uh, everything Councilor Jacy said is entirely accurate, and so I won't reiterate that. But also, aside from advocating to um, the other elements of government, please, uh, you don't have to wait for a forum. This is terrific. I'm happy to be here. But if you have questions or anything, just contact us directly. Um, we'll continue to advocate for you. Sylvester Road is at the end of a uh, route that used to be much longer uh, than. And I have a four-wheel drive pickup, and I wasn't going to. Well, I had a, I, I actually for the last two years have plowed this route, plus I plowed Route 66 by myself with one truck, all by my lonesome because we are so short-staffed. I'm not using that as an excuse, but as a matter of fact, the blizzard. I had the mayor with me. The mayor rode with me for the bulk of the night. And he got quite a uh, quite a uh, education, and he took a lot of photos. Made me stop a lot, so I was, you know, unfortunately a little slower than I normally am. But um. I, I also um, on that plowing. Now that I know you've been plowing for two years, I probably shouldn't make the comment. That's okay. You can say whatever you like. But also, they I've, don't. I've been plowing for more than two years. I've been plowing. No, I meant our years. street for two oh, years okay. because <laughs> it, it, it's not plowed wide enough. That's correct. You don't yeah. know where the edge of the streets are. And my husband, when he comes home, will plow it wider where it should be, hoping that somebody would follow his path, but they don't. And so then, therefore, by the end of the winter. <laughs> You know the street is, is wide, and and it's it's just because they don't know where the edge, and I don't know how you, you know how you determine that or how you figure that out when you're plowing and it's snowing and it's a blizzard and usually, you know usually when the front tire of the truck goes in the, it's over hectic. the edge of the road then I know well it's you know <laughs> I don't know but it yeah, but it's not I mean, that's really that's really how you do what I mean so he can so plow it I don't know you yeah. know he comes home and goes I plowed it I didn't have any trouble plowing it wider with my pickup truck and they can't plow it with you know, a big city truck, so it's just, but yeah, just a little, you know, frustration in the winter. Because so, I do know we do have a resident that Richard and I worked with very, very close last year on Sylvester Road, and he was very pleased because you took care of the situation. We also, Good. not to speak on, uh, in front of Rich, but we also try to have consistency in our plows where the same person is assigned the same mm -hmm. route on a regular basis mm -hmm. unless they're sick. Then yep. someone else might come in that doesn't know the route, right. and they might not know the width. Or I know by that mailbox, I got to be two feet away to be on the road or not. So that happens too. And mm -hmm. as the road gets closer and closer, we can't throw the snow back as far right. either. Yeah. So it becomes problem. Next, this year was terrible. With was ter yeah, Twenty-four yeah. inch storm we had. Yeah, this year was. Yeah, beyond. Yeah. You know, my, my, my main function during a snowstorm is I'm here to the from the very beginning to the very end. So that blizzard I worked. 36 hours straight. Yep. Went home a few times, took a shower, came back, and that, that was it. And the whole crew was here with us as well. And that, that was probably one of the toughest storms yeah, I'm sure. that I can remember so. since probably the 90s, the late 90s, we had a big blizzard at that time. So um, we, we are, the city has purchased a new a new 10-wheel dump truck that will be here as part of this root system. So the route actually will go quicker because the 10-wheel dump truck has a wing plow. Oh, yeah. And one of the problems is, is we don't have enough staff to double up on Route 66, and now that Route 66 was reconstructed, oh, yeah. it's wider. It takes four passes on one side for me to clear it. Mm -hmm. So it takes 
a lot Twice longer. As long so do that. that'll alleviate that. And yeah. I understand your concerns about being uh, working in the healthcare industry because we get these calls all the time. I'm stuck in my driveway. I'm stuck in my street. Can you come help me? And we try to alleviate people that are stuck if we can out in the city. You know, we don't plow their driveways, but we do try to help them out. Um, but I will take note of it. Uh, I will probably be plowing, and I will try to do a much better job. <laughs> and I, I want to give. Richard Pasoletti and his staff, a lot of credit. I've had several people in Ward 6 who were under hospice and were under critical condition with families knowing that they were going to lose their loved ones. I would just call them and say, can you please do this straight so that the visiting nurses can be there because this resident is is passing away. Mm -hmm. They're excellent. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they took the priority right away to make sure that the nurses could be there in that house to take care of that loved one. So that means a lot. It's good to hear that. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I want to thank everybody for being thank here. You. And if you ever want any other meetings, we can have them. I'm used to having a lot of meetings. So. <laughs> Thanks to Larry for Yeah, there's wine here, too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you, Nancy. Yeah.